Hello and welcome back to the Paleocast Gaming Network. I'm Gavin Davidson, a fresh face here to the channel, uh, and I'm here to tell you about some of the wonderful and not so wonderful aspects of the paleontological side of the Pokemon franchise. This video will contain some slight spoilery content for some stuff at the end of Pokemon Scarlet, so if you are one of those spoiler-averse types, uh, feel free to click away from this video and come back at a later point when you beat the game. But just to give those spoiler-averse folks a chance to click away, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit. Are you just going to come near me and explode, Voltorb? You sure are. That's strange. Like I said, my name is Gavin. Uh, I am a vertebrate paleontologist, and I mostly work with mammalian faunas of the late Miocene Great Plains here in North America, but I actually do very little paleontology sort of in my day-to-day -day work life. Currently, I work as the lab director for the Department of Geology and Environmental Geosciences at Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania. I mostly set up, you know, all of the intro level labs, the sort of very base level geology classes, all of their labs, as well as maintain the day-to-day -day functioning of a lot of our scientific testing equipment and just sort of some of the general functionings of the department. Also, as you might be able to tell by doing things like hosting this video on the on the Paleocast Gaming Network, I also love doing community outreach. Uh, I do a lot of that kind of thing. I also run our department's social media. So I love teaching cool people about cool facts about geology and paleontology in general. I also host a paleontology-focused podcast called I Wish You Were Dead with some friends who are not at all paleontologists, and they sort of help me break down different concepts about things that happened in Earth's history or different groups of animals in a way that is friendly to people who do not have that paleontology background. If that kind of thing sounds interesting to you, you can find our show, again called I Wish You Were Dead, here on YouTube or anywhere else that you can find podcasts. All right, so hopefully... Any of the folks who don't want to see any of this end game stuff are gone, so we can move on with the video. We're going to be talking about a new feature introduced in these newest games called Paradox Pokemon. These are Pokemon that came to the, the modern world of the games from the distant past, in the case of Pokemon Scarlet, or the distant future, in the case of Pokemon Violet. And given that I am a paleontologist, obviously I am much more interested in the ones that came from the distant past. So we're going to be looking at some of those, talking about where they could be getting some of their inspiration from, as well as uh, some of the unfortunate paleontological tropes that many pieces of media often fall into and are very obvious here in some of these Pokemon. However, that being said, I think it would be interesting to do a future video about the sort of speculative evolution of some of the ones that came from the future. So if you are interested in seeing that kind of video, make sure to let us know down in the comments. If you're familiar with the Pokemon franchise, you might know that in past games, there have been fossil Pokemon. Pokemon that have been revived from a fossil a la Jurassic Park. You go out, you find a fossil, you give it to a scientist, and then sometime later you come back to them and they give you a fully alive and functioning Pokemon. That is not at all what these Paradox Pokemon, as they're called, are. In fact, much to my chagrin, fossil Pokemon aren't even in this game, which I think was very much a misstep because I think it would fit the theme really well, but I, I'm not a game developer. No, instead of being Jurassic Parked back to life, these Paradox Pokemon, and, and here's the spoilery bit, are sent to the current time with a time machine. The professor of these games. Each game has a professor, and in this case, Pokemon Scarlet has one professor and Pokemon Violet has a different one. They put a Pokeball, the device used to capture Pokemon, into the time machine, and it goes to the past or future, respectively, and comes back with one of these Paradox Pokemon inside of it. Fossil Pokemon are unique in that they just are what they are. They are a Pokemon from the past that was resurrected to the future. There was not a future or past version of them, save for a couple of fan theories. For example, there is no modern version of Omanyte, a very classic fossil Pokemon from Generation 1. Omanyte just is. Unlike those fossil Pokemon, these Paradox Pokemon seem to be on the same evolutionary lineage as Pokemon that we've come to know and love over the years. Also, unlike traditional fossil Pokemon, there is no real clue as to when exactly these Pokemon are from in the past, you know, how far into the past they're from. 
most fossil Pokemon have some kind of Pokedex entry or, or lore about them, essentially, that says they're from the time of the dinosaurs, some of them explicitly say. Some of them say, uh, give a specific time. I believe one Pokedex entry says 300 million years ago. And based on what the, the real world fossil animal is that they're based on, that kind of makes sense, usually. With these Paradox Pokemon, it typically just says they're from the ancient past or distant past, which is very vague and not helpful at all to people like me who like to come up with uh, thoughts and theories about these kinds of Pokemon. And for example, the phrase distant past means very different things to a paleontologist and to a regular player of these games. So I really wish that they had given us any kind of context for that kind of thing, but alas, here we are. Also in the future, I'd like to do a video about what kinds of evolutionary selection pressures might have pushed these Paradox Pokemon to becoming the Pokemon that we see in the modern day that we're going to take a look at here. So again, if you want to see that kind of video, make sure to let us know. So with all of that intro information out of the way, let's actually take a look at some of these Paradox Pokemon, starting with the cover legendary, the mascot of Pokemon Scarlet, which is Coridon here. Coridon is very interesting because there are sort of two different forms of it you have this form here that is all plumaged and feathered up however you don't actually see this until the very end of the game you actually spend almost the entire game with the ride form of Coridon that you ride around throughout your journey on and as you can see it looks like a motorcycle <laughs> that is mm, why do you always want to fight me low kicks well, here we can see sort of the uh, modern version of Coridon, which is called Cyclozar. Like I said, you spend probably 99% of the game with Coridon, riding around on it on your various adventures, while the normies, who are not protagonists, ride around on Pokemon like Cyclozar here. And you can see the very obvious resemblance, uh, especially when uh, Cyclozar here ends up in sort of its ride form when it is running. So you can see Coridon curls up its tail to form sort of a back wheel, whereas if we send out Cyclozar here, it does the same. It runs and looks almost identical to Coridon. And then when it stops, it uncurls its tail and looks just sort of like a regular Pokemon. But you can see the very obvious connections here between the two. And very early in the game, well before we actually figure out what these Paradox Pokemon are, or even see any other Paradox Pokemon besides Coridon, it is pointed out how much Coridon looks like a Cyclozar. So like I said, you get access to riding around on Coridon at the basically the very beginning of the game. And like in the first 10 minutes, the one of your sidekick characters says, wow, that really looks like a bigger, kind of crazier Cyclozar. And in fact, Cyclozar is kind of a culturally important Pokemon to the people of the region where these games take place. And so, so much so that it says that there are cave drawings from 10,000 years ago of people with Cyclozar and riding Cyclozar. So presumably we know that these Pokemon must come from further back in the past than about 10,000 years ago. Cyclozar here is a dragon and normal type Pokemon, while Coridon is a dragon and fighting type Pokemon. And this is presumably sort of a reference to the general trope that things in the past were much more violent and things needed to be fighting for their lives all the time. That's what I would kind of chalk that up to. And this goes all the way back to things like uh, the original King Kong movie from the 1930s, where basically in every single scene in this sort of land of the lost sort of place, uh, King Kong is fighting some kind of dinosaur, and they're always the aggressor. Anytime they see a dinosaur, it wants to attack and kill them, even if it's an herbivorous, you know, generally, likely not particularly aggressive dinosaur. Coridon's in-game ability also makes the weather harsh sunlight, and this is also probably some kind of reference to the past seeming more harsh and inhospitable. And lastly, for some of Coridon here's tropes, it's plumage that it kind of gets is maybe not the most tastefully inspired. To me, this kind of invokes an image of Native American headdresses and to be sort of relating them to a thing from the ancient past that is 
the, there is a second crowd in, in the game that is very violent and attacks you any chance it gets. And to be sort of associating those two is not great in the year 2022, given how Native American cultures have often been depicted as uncultured or un uncivilized. So, not awesome. Next up, we have the first Paradox Pokemon other than Coridon that you see in the game, which is Great Tusk. And yes, they all have kind of weird names like this. And its modern counterpart, Donphan. I think that these two really clearly demonstrate sort of the whole aesthetic that the, the developers and the, the artists that created these Pokemon were sort of going for. If you look at the two of them, A, Great Tusk is just much larger than than Don Fan is, and we'll see if we can get to move around quite a bit more by having him play with this little soccer ball here, which is pretty, it's very cute to actually do this in the game. Uh, as you can see, Great Tusk's tusks are much larger uh, and much more curved, likely based off of some kind of mammoth. That's a very characteristic mammoth thing, is having big, inwardly curved tusks like that. But as well as just all the spikes along the back, uh, the tail is much more long and, and thick, sort of like a dinosaur's tail almost. And uh, if we can sort of get a decent look at its mouth, it is very spiky for s some reason. Uh, Donphan is very much not like that. Uh, to the point where I don't even think its tusks are really included in its mouth. The general theme that most pieces of media use when they bring something from the past to the present is that it is usually bigger, meaner, spikier, and generally more, you know, aggressive and usually also less intelligent. And this is generally true for what they do with Great Tusk here as well, because the first time it is referenced, uh, you sort of see a, an artist's depiction of it in uh, a notebook, and it says that it straight up killed somebody the first time that they saw one, which was very surprising to see in a Pokemon game. But in general, I decided to start with Great Tusk because it really does exemplify all the various themes that we're going to talk about here. Having more spines, bigger features, uh, even including all the overgrown fur around its feet, uh, being more aggressive, and just being bigger, meaner, and spikier. That's a very common theme that everything uses when they incorporate animals or uh, other things from ancient times. However, I do really like that they incorporated some... What were you just doing? Some real-life uh, science-y things from, you know, a real-life group of animals that Donphan, clearly inspired by an elephant, is related to, which would be the mammoths. Because there is sort of a mammoth-y Pokemon, uh, Mammal Swine, who does not have big curved, you know, at least inwardly curved tusks like this. So I think that's pretty cool to see, actually. Next up, we have the Paradox Pokemon Brute Bonnet and its modern counterpart, the mushroom Pokemon, Amoongus. These two are very strange, and again, just really run with a lot of the themes. You can see here it's got some extra spikes on the top of its mushroom cap. Uh, it's got some kind of overgrown foliage on it to make it look sort of just ancient, more wild. Uh, they give it legs and a tail for some reason. Uh, as you can see on Amoongus here, it doesn't have anything like that it's just a mushroom with hands um so that's a that's a very curious decision i honestly think that they probably did that just to make it look a little more just different than you know the base form amoongus because otherwise it just has some spikes on the top and then the overgrown uh sort of drapery around its mushroom cap however one of its pokedex entries does sort of describe it as uh there, there's sort of apparently some kind of cryptozoology or like conspiracy theory type magazine that exists in these worlds that talks about some of these paradox pokemon and that magazine apparently referred to this as a cross between a mushroom and a dinosaur so that's probably why uh it's got sort of the the tail and legs here but some other just general features about brute bonnet it's a little tougher to see but you can see right there its mouth is also very spiky while amoongus if i can get a good look at its face here is not it's just got a little sort of whole mouth. So again, just running with the same general themes that uh, we saw with Great Tusk here as well. Also, they usually uh, change the types between the modern form and the ancient form. And so uh, while Amoongus here is a grass and poison type, they made Brute Bonnet a grass and dark type, uh, which actually in Japanese is uh, called the evil type. 
So it's not like physically dark or as in darkness. It is in dark as in like intent. And also they bumped up its attack stat by a lot, like almost doubling it. Uh, so they took the whole ancient aggressiveness thing and really ran with it. These next few Paradox Pokemon are interesting because they all are from unevolved forms. So in Pokemon, there's a concept of evolution. By that, I don't mean real-world biological evolution. In Pokemon, it works much more like metamorphosis. The organism, a Pokemon in this case, starts their life cycle as one form, for example, a caterpillar, and ends it as another form, for example, a butterfly. I almost said the actual Pokemon name, Butterfree, but a butterfly. The first one of these Pokemon that we're going to talk about is the original Pokemon, Magneton, here, which can evolve into this Pokemon, Magnezone, normally. But the Paradox Pokemon, Sandy Shocks, is very clearly based on Magneton, not the fully evolved form. Oh, that's cute. They're all sleeping. So the way that Magneton, the, the three formed one here in front of me, evolves into Magnezone is through the use of an item, in this case, the Thunderstone. And just quickly, the only thing that I could come up with as to why this monstrosity that we're going to talk about in a little more detail here in a second, um, it doesn't evolve further is because that sort of would involve the intervention of a human. And presumably, either humans had not biologically evolved yet, humans were not around to give this thing an item to be able to make it evolve, uh, or at the very least, if humans were around, they weren't having this relationship with Pokemon that they were interacting with them. Uh, so this would be sort of the equivalent of humans pre the domestication of dogs uh, from wolves. So the human-wolf relationship before domestication happened. And the other Paradox Pokemon that are based off of not fully evolved Pokemon also evolve using items. That's the only thing I could really find in common between them. So I assume that there is some kind of lore reason behind it, but they don't give us any lore reason behind it. So that's the best I got. And the reason why I'm explaining this here with Sandy Shocks instead of any of the others is because I really don't have all that much to say about Sandy Shocks. Uh, these Pokemon are very clearly made out of man-made materials. Uh, Magneton here in the original Generation 1 games, Red and Blue, is only able to be found uh, near a power plant. So presumably, it has some kind of man-made origins, which doesn't make any sense with Sandy Shocks here. Clearly, it has some kind of caveman inspiration with the, the hair on the top of its head, which is clearly uh, some kind of like iron filings, likely, which I think is very fun. But yeah, this one's just kind of silly. I don't have any excuse for why this wasn't a future Paradox Pogemon. Sort of circling back to that cryptozoology-esque magazine that I mentioned earlier, it specifically says that Sandy Shocks here looks a lot like a magneton that lived for reportedly 10,000 years. So maybe this is supposed to be the natural end of its life cycle? Instead of evolving into Magnezone, maybe naturally, if you just let a magneton live long enough, it would turn into this? Maybe that's stretching a bit, but it's what the developers gave us to work with, so here we are. Moving on to the next one. Next on the list, we have Scream Tail and its modern counterpart, one of the most popular Pokemon of all time, Jigglypuff. And you can see clearly, uh, Screamtail is clearly based off of Jigglypuff, not its evolution, Wigglytuff. Like I mentioned with Magneton and Sandy Shocks, uh, the way you get Jigglypuff to evolve into Wigglytuff is by use of an item, in this case, the Moonstone. Screamtail isn't as sort of trope heavy as some of the others, so I don't have all that much to talk about. It's basically just bigger, as well as its feet uh, have points on the end of it. It's got a tail. I don't know why they gave all of them tails. I don't understand that personally. But basically, they give it some kind of more facial markings, uh, as well as those two little tiny fangs right there on its mouth, as well as, again, making it sort of head poof, uh, very overgrown. Once again, our trusty cryptozoology magazine sort of has something to say about Screamtail. Unfortunately, this one is not at all helpful because it says that Screamtail resembles a Jigglypuff from one billion, with a B, years ago. And in general, like I said with all the fossil Pokemon, they generally line up with uh, 
real world geological dates for the you know real world animals that the fossil Pokemon are based off of. This doesn't make any kind of sense because uh, multicellular multicellular life really wasn't around a billion years ago. If you're stretching, maybe it had just gotten its start, but that's a big stretch. So do with that what you will. Lastly, for all of these unevolved forms, we have Fluttermane and its modern counterpart, Mistrevis, as well as Mistrevis' evolved form, Miss Magius. Again, Mistrevis evolves into Miss Magius using a Dusk Stone, so another evolutionary item, but Fluttermane does not evolve. Very similar to what they did with Screamtail, the last one with Jigglypuff, they pretty much just made Fluttermane a bigger Mistrevis. They made sort of its hair longer and more outgrown, although they did kind of make the ends of it feathery, which I really don't understand, as well as having those almost look like scales to me, or at least a video game representation of scales on the ends of its sort of hair. They also gave it those big spikes on the top of its head, as well as making sort of the back of its head a little more spiky. Our friendly cryptozoology magazine also had something to say about Fluttermane, but this one's kind of the most off the wall. It says that it has features similar to a ghostly pterosaur that was also previously featured in a magazine. I don't know if that's supposed to be a reference to something else, but anyway... Not a whole lot else to really mention about Fluttermane, so we'll keep moving on. Second to last, we have Slitherwing and its modern counterpart, Volcarona. And this one is also very kind of off the wall. Uh, it basically turns it back into almost a, a larva form. To me, it looks a lot like when the wings of a winged insect emerge from the pupa, which is why I put Volcarona's sort of first evolution stage Larvesta here, because uh, while Volcarona flies around, Slitherwing runs around on the ground. And so to me, it looks a lot like Larvesta in that way. Like Coridon, and uh, also Great Tusk, although I didn't mention it in... in Great Tusk's little segment. Uh, they made this a fighting type, which again is probably just a reference to the past being a more violent, chaotic time. And again, they gave it a tail with spikes that I don't understand why they keep giving things tails. In my opinion, this is this one's kind of the biggest miss, in my opinion, for cool things that they could have done, because there's lots of lore around Volcarona here that mentions that in various parts of, you know, humanity's past, Volcarona served as like the embodiment of the sun during like particularly harsh winters or during times when the sun was blocked out by volcanoes or things. Volcarona uh, helped keep, you know, the plants alive and helped keep humanity warm during these times of crisis. And while Volcarona is a bug and fire type, they took away the fire type from Slitherwing. And there's nothing about this thing that says that it should be the embodiment of the sun. So that's a little unfortunate in my opinion. I think they could have done a lot with that, but they chose to give it a giant spiky tail, and have it be bipedal occasionally. Unfortunately, unlike the others, uh, our favorite cryptozoology magazine doesn't have anything to say, really, about Slitherwing, so on to our final contestant. For our final past Paradox Pokemon, we have Roaring Moon and its modern counterpart, Salamence. As well as I included Bagon, the first form of Salamence here as well, because there is a little bit of inspiration, if Roaring Moon will let me see it, on its head there. It keeps sort of Bagon's little helmet uh, that Salamence does not. Roaring Moon kind of takes the spiky jaggedness trope of all things from the past really to the extreme. As you can see on its wing, uh, there's just spikes everywhere. Coming off of the back here, it has like a spiky kind of cloak. Um, its claws are very spiky, its face is very spiky, it's even got spikes like on its forearms for some reason. One of my favorite things though is that Roaring Moon actually has some really interesting lore to it. So, in past Pokemon games there have been this uh, sort of gimmick called Mega Evolution, which is sort of a an only in battle thing, not like the evolution that we've talked about, like how Bagon evolves into Salamence. Instead, this is a thing that only happens in battle and then it goes back to regular Salamence in this example after the battle's done. So especially in the wings, 
Roaring Moon looks a lot different than Salamence here. Thank you very much for just lining up very conveniently. That was very nice of you two. The wings of Roaring Moon here look a lot like Mega Salamence's wing, where it's just sort of one crescent-shaped wing. And that favorite cryptozoology magazine says that this creature, Roaring Moon, has some kind of relationship to a phenomenon in a certain region. That's some, It's phrased something like that. Which is clearly a reference to Mega Evolution, which was very big in uh, the Generation 6 region of Kalos, which is based on France, whereas these games are based off of Spain, which is, you know, France and Spain are neighbors. Also, a little bit deeper into that lore, if we look at some of the Pokedex entries for Mega Salamence from past games, it says that Mega Salamence is extremely aggressive, so much so that it is referred to as the Blood-Soaked Crescent, which, again, it's just very strange to hear in a Pokemon game. So clearly, Roaring Moon is based not off of regular base form Salamence here, but off of Mega Salamence, which I think is really neat because they haven't really had Mega Evolution in any of the games in probably close to five years now. And with all of these three sleeping very cutely here, that's where I'm going to end it off. These were all of the paleo tropes that I could personally spot with all of these past Paradox Pokemon, say that five times fast. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you spotted any that I missed or your general thoughts on some of these Pokemon from the past. Thanks for watching the PaleoCast Gaming Network. I've been Gavin, and I will see you next time.